Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this special and very important event tonight at the Wheeler Centre. One in two, juvenile injustice. The fact that every second young person in detention in Australia is Indigenous. Tonight, this gig is presented by Big Heart in partnership with the Melbourne Festival and the Wheeler Centre. And we'd just like to acknowledge some people who've helped make this night happen. Woodside, Brighty, the Nullamara Injabandi Foundation and the Australia Council, thank you very much. My name is Sophie McNeil, I'm a reporter with ABC. I normally work on international issues. I've been working on international issues the last few years, but when I was asked to do this tonight, I couldn't think of a more important issue here at home, especially as a West Australian. You'll hear a lot about WA tonight. Before we introduce tonight's speakers, We've got a special message. It's come straight from the Pilbara, from a magistrate there called Dean Potter, and he would have loved to be here tonight. Valerie. Hello, I'm a magistrate from living in the Pilbara. The Pilbara is a big part of Western Australia. Western Australia is a big part of Australia, one third of it. As a magistrate in Western Australia, I have travelled thousands of kilometres every year to sit in court in many different communities. Every community is a little bit different, but some things are the same. There are many different language groups. Many people do not understand or speak English very well, especially the English that is spoken in the courtroom. There are happy stories and there are sad stories told in court. Sometimes as a magistrate, I have to look people in the eye and tell them that they have to go to jail for the wrong things they have done. That is not easy thing to do. It means that they will be taken away from their family and country and put in a place where it's dangerous and violent. You have to be tough to get through prison. You have to hide your feelings when, when you should be doing is facing your feelings and your past. I know this when I tell people they are going to prison it is not easy to know this. I try and give people a chance to behave themselves to do good in their community. But sometimes there is too much grog, too much anger, very little respect for each other. It means fighting, it means people getting hurt. And sometimes people do not want to change. That is when they go to prison. Because as a magistrate I have to think about everyone, not just one person. I have to listen to all of the stories and then make a decision about what to do. If there were more people who really understood the difficulties in delivering justice in regional and remote Australia, it would help. Have a look at a map of Western Australia. See where Robin is. See where Jigalong is. See where Kanagari is. Newman, Marble Bar, Port Hedland. These are special places a long way from the city. This is where I'm from. This is my backyard. I must look after it and help it grow and be the best that it can be. Thank you, Ellery and Max. So we really wanted that message to set up this evening and I'm very proud I'm pleased to introduce Allery Sandy and the fact she's come all the way from Roeburn to be with us tonight. It's in the Pilbara in West Australia and she's very honoured to also have her grandchildren with her tonight. You might hear from them later, Nelson and Max. And they're also stars. And if you've got a ticket tomorrow night to Hip Bone Sticking Out, which I think is sold out, then uh, you'll also get to see their amazing work too. Now, Allery is an accomplished painter, an educator, a performer and a community leader in her hometown of Roeburn. And Further from that, she's worked in early childhood education for over 25 years and has even won awards for doing that work from the Department of Education in West Australia. Allery Sandy is the auntie of John Pat, the 16-year-old Injabandi man who died in 1983 in a Roeburn lockup, an untimely death which triggered the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And it's not just her grandchildren who star in the play tomorrow night. Allery is also one of the stars. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, Allery. Mm. 
Our next guest is Peter McBain. He's the Managing Director of Brighty, a West Australian company with around 500 employees that specialises in civil construction and mining and is a leader in Indigenous employment. It strives to increase its workplace participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and to also engage with local Indigenous businesses. Brighty's leadership in this area has been recognised numerous awards, including the 2014 Indigenous Employment Award, and they were also finalists in the Pinnacle Awards. Peter's been involved personally in projects all over the country in West Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia, Queensland, and Victoria. So thanks for being with us today. <laughs> Barbara Bakey has over 20 years experience working at all levels of government and she was one of the first female centre directors in a juvenile justice detention centre, which is a really tough gig in a very male-dominated environment. And during that time, Barbara led major reforms. She worked in Wagga Wagga, and she established a young offender support scheme, spent a lot of time working with the community there to try to reduce the rate of Indigenous young people in detention. Barbara also lectures at Charles Sturt University, and at the moment she's very busy finishing a PhD. Thanks so much for being with us tonight, Barbara. <laughs> now, Scott Rankin is a writer, director, and the creative director of Big Heart, one of Australia's leading arts and social change companies. At the heart of their approach is the simple but very important idea, it's harder to hurt someone if you know their story. Big Heart has won eight Coalition of Australia Heads of Government COAG Awards, a World Health Organisation Award, the 2008 Maya Performing Arts Group Award, and an AFI, and I couldn't list them all. And I also can't list the number of productions that Scott has worked on over the years. All over the country, internationally, it's been 22 years of a very productive <laughs> um, career. And tomorrow night, the most recent project which Scott wrote and directed is premiering here in Melbourne, Hip Bone Sticking Out, which tells the story of John Pat, Allery's nephew, and that's tomorrow night in the Melbourne Festival. So thanks so much for being here tonight, Scott. <laughs> and Scott, I wanted to start by asking about this one in two campaign that Big Heart is trying to set up. Tell us why do so many Australians, why do they not even know about these statistics and that this issue exists? Yeah, I th well, I think Australia is a is a generous country, and I'm a raging optimist. And um, mostly, when things uh, go wrong, it's because either a story is being manipulated or it's an invisible story. And Big Art is interested in um, bringing together groups of you know highly accomplished artists who have other careers to work on invisible stories to make them visible. Um, and if you, can, if you can imagine that a country, or a nation is a narration, um, if your story is not part of that narration or you're there but it's not recognised, then the shape of the, of the narration will not be influenced by you. So from our point of view, the future is an idea in the present. And so we have to do some things in story, on stage, to inspire and to, to create moments where people go, I see it, I, I see this needs to be different. And then you need to take some things off stage and think about uh, where to place other forms of story. So that can be in um, occupying Melbourne, that can be in uh, federal parliament, that can be in, in preschools. And there's a whole range of different audiences. So what we're interested in doing is telling the stories, the invisible stories, and then than having a, a policy outcome. And for this one, it is totally unacceptable for, m for me to be a, a white, successful father of children in a country where other children are being locked up at a rate of 51.8% being Indigenous. That is not my country. So, it, so how, to, how to do something about that, if you take the, the invisible story thing, is to, is to make the story visible and then the idea is to get people, as they understand that story, to um, to put their address, for instance, into a we in into a website that we've set up, that will firstly show them all the other people working in this space, and then if they want to, they can they can put their address in, and they'll be told where their nearest uh, you know um, polling booth is in which primary school near their place, and and if you want to. 
uh, you can find out at that polling booth what's the difference between the, um, the right and the left, the candidates there. And it might only be 32 people in that particular polling booth. And that becomes a target for you and your friends to write 32 letters um, or get 32 friends to write a letter to, to Cabinet, to the Minister, and it'll, it will register federally in a climate where we're, we've got a, an Indigenous, a Prime Minister for Indigenous Affairs and we're 20 months from an election, or 20, whatever it is, 23 months from an election. That's a, that's a beautiful time to be starting to think about the story in the future. So there's a few things we're doing at once, and I'll shut up in a second. There is the flagship hip bone sticking out, which is touring with, it's with the, the Pat family, it's with Allery keeping us safe, grandchildren are in it. It's a, a, a raw, sto real story that tells you exactly um, what's happening and what could happen. It's very optimistic. And then there's a thing called the Muru concert. Muru was uh, John Pat's nickname. And that concert is 10 songs of freedom written in the, in the Pilbara prison. And that's rolling out around the country. We're trying to find sponsors to help us to do 20 big shows um, in, in 24 months, and we just opened the Melbourne Festival in Fed Square. I don't know if you were there, but Peter, your company is helping us to fund that. And, and that is to get the story out, and then there's this very direct policy-based um, intervention federally to, to parliamentarians who want to do the right thing, senior advisors who want to do the right thing, and we have to get a new voice to come into Cabinet that will de-risk that process so that at a COAG level, states will come on board and want to do the right thing, and magistrates won't be forced into putting, into putting very beautiful young men and women into situations where they learn criminality and families, you know, are pulled apart. So it's that multi-layered strategy. I hope I got that all in. <laughs> we'll go to you, Alary, because we want to hear about the personal effect of these statistics. There's so much more than just statistics. And that figure of 51% is nationally. In West Australia, it's 80% of young people in detention are Indigenous. What happens when 80% of the young people in your town of Roeburn, what happens when they're in detention? What effect does it have? It has a lot of effect in our community and families start to worry and to hear how the children are going and they don't want them to be committing suicide in these places where they're being sent away and that does put a lot of pressure on our community because families are families and we do love and care for each other and we want to support our young ones who get into these places and it's a matter of looking for help in places like government places. Who do we talk to? We want to know how our children are going and what's happening and sometimes our kids rings up and they feel homesick, they don't want to have don't have anyone to talk to, and that's put a lot of pressure on our community people and parents. And yeah, what has it done to family units in a place like Roeburn? I guess it really breaks up the family. And when a child does come back from tension and he's, he he needs a lot of support, and sometimes parents are finding it hard how to support my child, or I think they need to communicate and to see where they can go from there when a child is coming out of detention or when a child is in there. And it's really a sad thing. And I have a lot of that in my community. Yeah. Is the idea of going to prison, does that act as a deterrent to young people in the Pilbara? Um, it doesn't do any good. Because once they're in the prison, where is the next step of help for them when they're out of that prison? What can be done? to motivate our families to not to get into trouble again. And I guess for our community and everywhere else, it's a tough question. Mm. Barbara, as a former centre manager, what happens when prison is no longer a deterrent? Well, uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land here, the Kulin people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and thank them for the continuing contribution. That was meant to be my job. I'm very <laughs> sorry, I forgot. I'm not very good at presenting. <laughs> it's one of my first gigs. <laughs> Please, Barbara, um, tell us. Well, certainly, I'd just like to paint a picture of the centre that I managed. It was in uh, rural New South Wales and in New South Wales we know that NSW stands for Newcastle, Sydney and Wollongong, so we were over the mountains. And it was, that was good in a way because I was able to do a lot of things there that 
weren't able to be done otherwise. But what happened with a lot of the young people is that it wasn't that scary to come into the centre because usually their family members were there or their cousins or, you know, so it wasn't scary. And the worst thing was that once you lock a young person up, that is the single most damaging factor that will lead them to reincarceration, will lead them back into the centre. So there was a big challenge there to try and uh, keep young people out and also to, because it was almost such a common thing in, in their communities, it was actually like a, a rite of passage that, well, you know, now I'm in the centre and that was very difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. What change did you initiate when you had that position to try and make sure that the kids wouldn't end up there in the first place? Because I know you spent a lot of time in the community as well, but also that they wouldn't end up back there. How did you try and do things differently? Well, first of all, I was the first female manager and that's really, you know, it's really not a place for, for you, girly. It's, um, you know, it's a boy's world. Okay, that's the first step. And so I really had to work hard at engaging with the staff and uh, there was a continuum of staff. There was some staff up the end that were really keen and ready for change. There was a big continuum that wasn't, that would come and go. And then there was a continuum up the end that actually pulled against the change. But one of the significant things that I managed to do was when young people came into the centre, all that there was was punishment. There was no reward for good behaviour, so there was no incentive. So there was a lot of incidents where uh, there was fighting, windows were broken. So I thought, well, let's look at how we can change that. So I engaged the staff and the young people. It had to engage the young people to make the reward system uh, relevant to them. And every staff member over a period of months sat in and we developed this reward system so that if they behave themselves, they could get a reward. And we didn't put something up really big. It was... You know, if they behave themselves for a day, they could get something or they could save it up. And we found that young people would save up their rewards and get Nike shoes or track suits so that it was really meaningful to them. How, I'd, how did I pay for that? I paid for it because there weren't so many windows broken mm -hmm. and there weren't so many young people locked up. So it was a win-win-win for everybody. I also, to... Um, set up an Ab Aboriginal advisory board because I needed to have support in what needed to happen. I also made a real push to engage more Aboriginal staff. And with that uh, Aboriginal board, we also set up a mentoring system because, as I said, we were in rural New South Wales. A lot of these young people were four or five hours from home and although we sponsored their families to come, they could only come intermittently. So we set up a system where they actually had somebody in custody that would keep them in line, would, you know, would, would encourage them to behave themselves. We also had really innovative programs, like Big Heart came, came and ran a fantastic program. And we also um, encouraged people to get out of the centre whenever we could. We made an alliance with the local football club, which my sons later played for, and my son is still the manager which was the brothers football. And there was a large number of Aboriginal players in that team. And they put a real expectation on these young kids and they expected them to behave because if they didn't, they couldn't go out to football. And when somebody expects you to be good, it's remarkable what happens. And the young people really settled into it. We also had a system where we encouraged uh, young people to go out. We had an apprenticeship scheme. We had work experience. And one of those young kids who went out on work experience ended up as a manager of a Kmart store years down the track. And the time that they came in, we started exiting them. We started planning to put support in them with their families, their communities, that they would go back out with support, not just open the door and kick them out because the first three months is the time where they're most at risk of coming back because we give them three meals a day, you know, they don't have to think about anything. The other, other thing we did with them with school was we, most of these kids had dropped out of school, they had very low literacy levels, so we had to be very creative how we um, engage them in school because education is truly one of the key factors 
of supporting people to, to not offend. We had school where we had a local radio and the kids got to participate in presenting on the local radio. Now to do that, you have to read because you have to be able to read the, the soundtracks. So reading was important. We also had to um, add up because you can't have gaps in the presentation. So we encouraged reading and writing in different ways. We also had um, an Aboriginal um, painter come in that taught painting. So we really engaged the kids as much as we possibly could. And I guess my thing was do no harm to these kids while they're here. Mm. Try and send them out no more damage than when they came in. The risk of reoffending. the statistics on reoffending are so high. Allery, can you <coughs> tell us what are the attitude of the young people when they come out towards going back in? Or how big a deal is it for them? Tell us what are their attitudes towards I that? I think the biggest attitude I've had and witnessed one was a young girl who spent at the age of 13 until she was 15 and and when she came back home from a from a juvenile side of the thing and then she said I've had enough and I thought oh what can we do to help you I want to go to go away from this place so we had to look around for help to support her and say if she wants to better her schooling and change her attitude and ways, we as the parents and grandparents need to be alongside of her and help her along and encourage her. And when I look back to now, to what she was and to where she is today, I'm really proud of her for, for what she's done. And she's 18 now and she still wants to go and do further, like getting into sports and she loves doing activities. And for our young ones in our community, I see a change is coming through the big art itself and for the Neomad project that was done in Robin. There are many little children wanting to do something and to be who they want to be. And they want to have a voice and they want to do acting and all that. And I see that coming now towards our area. And I've seen my grandson changing, you know. He had to prove it to be a better person and he can do it. And people say that Aboriginal kids are dumb and can't read and write, but that is wrong because I know in my own heart kids can read. They can play dumb, but they have what they have that you and I can't read their minds. And I'm really proud of these kids that are in the Hip Bone Sticking Out project and they've come a long way to be, to be who they are. And out in my community, I see a lot of changes and a lot of things are coming our way and we just have to grab it and encourage our kids, look, Go for it, you know, do what you want to do and we can be right along beside you. And this is what the children just need. They need to be heard. They need someone to listen to them. And there are times when we need to pull back and say, yes, I'm here. I want to hear what you want to say. I want to help. And those are the things that we need to change in our community. And have someone like Barbara yes. believe in them as well. Yes. Help. yes. Peter, can you give us an insight into corporate Australia's attitude towards this? You know, you have... 500 employees and it's around 100 Indigenous employees t tells you you specifically try and hire ex-offenders, low-risk offenders. Well, why is that? And tell us that, a bit behind that policy. I guess it's just part of a wider program that we have in, in relation to uh, our Aboriginal engagement. Um, and we have, as, as you say, we have employed uh, through a couple of programs in Western Australia Outlook uh, some, some former offenders. Uh, that have re-entered the workforce directly through us on on their release from custody. Uh, and the same in the Northern Territory. Uh, we've had three or four people come through the, the Northern Territory Corrective Services and, and do the same thing. In the Northern Territory, uh, a slightly better program, I think a little bit more relaxed, where there's some day release work that happens prior to the, to the person being released, uh, where they can come and work dawn to dusk type type arrangements and then uh, and then when they are released they they transition uh, they've already got the job they're used to the people that they're working for it's not a full transition from custody into new living arrangements and a new job it's the, the part of the transition's mm. already happened so I think it's a it's a pretty good way to enter back into the workforce but not many companies would would want to do that would want to hire people they know 
have offended and, and spent time inside. So why is it important for your company to, to look past that fact, I guess, and really provide a future for these young people? It's probably a larger question. The Aboriginal engagement stuff that we do in our company is very important to us, so culturally as a company. Um, we do it for, for lots of reasons. One, that we think it's good for us as people. We think it's good for us as an organisation. I think people these days like to work for organisations that are engaged uh, in social benefit type projects. Uh, it certainly helps with, with retaining the services and the, the longer term retention of, uh, say, Gen Y people in your business if, if they can see that you stand for something other than just dollars and cents. Uh, we do it because our clients, it's of great benefit to our clients and the communities in which we work. And we work throughout Western Australia and into the Northern Territory, lots of communities. So we have a really broad brushed approach to Aboriginal engagement. Uh, with the sort of statistics that we talked about earlier uh, and the, you know, the, the amount of young people that are in prison, at the moment there are 100 uh, Aboriginal people that work for Bridie or working on Bridie projects. So with those sorts of statistics, many of them have had at some stage or another a stint, a stint in prison. And so we just see it as another way that we can be helping to, to heal the rift, I guess. And what kind of special measures has your company implemented to make these young Indigenous employees feel welcome and adjust, I guess, after after yeah. spending time inside? We, we do cultural awareness sort of training throughout the organisation. Uh, most of our projects start with a welcome to country. Some will start with smoking ceremonies. We do talk about the, you know, the local language groups within the, the projects and the, the areas in, in which we work. And we, so we do educate people, we educate our, educate our supervisors. Um, when we look for entry-level positions into the company, we make them initially and firstly available to Aboriginal candidates. Uh, so that's a first choice. It's an opportunity for people to get entry-level positions within the company. Um, we really do just try to provide an opportunity for young people, particularly to get a start in industry and to change their lives. Scott, one particularly shocking statistic on this issue is that between 2000 and 2010, indigenous, the Indigenous imprisonment rate rose 55%. What went so wrong in those 10 years in Australia? Um, I'm inclined to think it's more to do with uh, the, the permissions we give to our political leaders to, um, to speak uh, in inflammatory ways about sensitive issues rather than dealing with them. So um, if we're giving permission for politicians to have an easier ride to an election, to a successful election, then politicians will find it difficult to resist that and to be innovative in their task. And, um, and so, you know, it's, you might say, what is the relationship between Briety and an arts company? Why would they be interested in us? And, and vice versa. Well, to me, it's, um, it's a word that Allery's taught us, uh, Muraguthara, working together or hand in hand. In hand. And we are specialist storytellers. And, it, and if I'm up to the, the level of, you know, my ability, if I can do, if I can be the Usain Bolt of, of storytelling, um, I can make it much, much harder for uh, that relationship out in, in the media world to be um, so manipulated by another narrative which is which is the law and order campaigns because mm -hmm. um, that trickles down to policies that are put in place and then the hands of magistrates being tied and then down through that system and you know um, if people could meet um, Nelson they would they would meet this incredible young man, grandson of Allery. If, if they couldn't meet him, in other words, if they saw him, they would probably want to cross the street because they would read certain kinds of, you know, incredible performing ability as outrageous and quite dangerous behaviour. <laughs> so it is a story. It's a national story. Now, what we have to be very careful of um, is that we as as white Australia, if you like, frame the way in which the Indigenous story is told. And it's one of misery and a dying pillow and um, dysfunction and 
uh, and addiction and that it's all finished with. But that's not the indigenous story of cultural strength and cultural power and, and the capacity to, to, to deal with cultural trauma over, you know, ten generations. Um, it's a story we have to own. And so if you think, okay, from, you know, that... that 10 year period or whatever, that, there was that 55% rise. It's just as possible to turn that, ri that around in the next 10 years. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of how the story is told and the permissions to tell story and what story to tell and who owns the story, you know. And the Keating thing, I suppose, of, you know, it was we, it begins with the recognition that we did the dispossession. To me, that's, an, that's still a, brand new, a fresh narrative, a fresh story. Mm. And then being super savvy about where you place that. It's, you know, uh, to, that, that to me is what we're all doing. It's what I think Bridie is doing. It's what Nelson and Max are doing tomorrow night. And there are still some tickets left, but it's okay. selling out super fast. Mm. <laughs> and, yeah. Barbara, I'm interested in your research on that, that rapid increase in, in those 10 years of the 55%. There's also uh, an increase of women in detention for things like fines, which we know is a big problem in Western Australia particularly. What did you learn looking at that rapid rise? I think there's a whole range of reasons why that happened and not the least that um, Scott mentioned, but I think there's a whole range of uh, racist practice, practices and attitudes in policing and I think that that gets played out in the number of um, policing officers in particular areas. And also, too, uh, I found that a lot of people, young people, came in with the trifecta. Mm. And the trifecta is uh, offensive language, resist arrest, and offensive behaviour. Now, I saw this played out one day by a young boy who had been in custody, and he was down the street, and he was going to an ATM, which is something we all do. And the police saw him go, saw him as they drove past. And that's one thing that happens in smaller regional areas, but also, too, in suburban areas, that the police get to know who's who. And you know. So they saw this young, young boy and um, they said, hey, what are you doing? And he's, he's had it because he's been in custody. He said, F off. They said, what? Come here. He said, oh, I'm not coming here. So, and then sort of gave a bit of, you know, push. So he's up on the trifecta. That's just to start with. And then, you know, I've seen lots of silly... Um, charges. So that, that's one thing. But I also think it goes much deeper than that and it's about things like the loss of language because in, in uh, New South Wales the, a lot of language has been lost and it's really hard to define what that means and what, that, what happens to a person when that happens. Because if you're all of a sudden told that you can't speak in English, who am I? What am I? And I have a friend at the moment that that's, has a is a Croatian, and she's teaching her child Croatian. So this child knows where and where he came from. Now, a lot of Aboriginal culture and families have lost that and really struggled to sort of redefine that. So there's there's that, and there's also too, I guess, a range of uh, diversionary programs that are very rigid. And I think with Aboriginal young offenders that they come into the system much earlier. They get picked up mm -hmm. so that if there's things and there's a bit of a track that they go down where it's, um, you know, good behaviour bond, uh, probation, community service order, lock up. And if they start that earlier, then they're going to end up in custody much earlier. What about mandatory sentencing? This has been something big in West Australia. How's that played a big part of that increase? I think it's played a big part in Western Australia. It's also been in Northern Territory. It hasn't been in, in other states in Australia. But what that means is that the options run out very quickly because I understand in Western Australia it's three strikes and you're out. Mm. So, well, three strikes so and you're what in. Kind of, what kind of things are these young kids ending up inside for? Is it as simple as swearing at a cop, being involved? No. The, the majority of, of young offence, offences are property offences. They aren't... Um, violent offences, although there has been in, has been an increase in that, but the majority of them are locked up for pretty silly things. Mm -hmm. um, I say silly things. And that was in your own centre. You saw that. Absolutely. So, how, what can you do as a centre manager? I mean, uh, we have the separation of powers between 
the judiciary and the departments. But what, what can you do when you see these kids ending up for what you say are silly offences, that that's why they're inside? If at all possible, we will get them out on... Um, we, we would appeal. Mm -hmm. um, a number of young offenders come in on um, uh, remand that they're not allowed... You know, they have, they've been refused bail. Immediately, we will try and find them somewhere to, to live because often the reason they're locked up is because they don't have somewhere to go. So we work very hard to get them out. Um, so, I mean, if, if they came in and the offences weren't as serious, I mean, they're, they're generally their sentence would be shorter so that they wouldn't be in for mm -hmm. so long. But we will work really hard to get them out as soon as possible. Ellery, I've heard this described, this phenomenon of one in two, described as a, a second stolen generation. What do you think of that idea? Stolen generation. Yeah, it's a sad issue because once they come back and try and to regroup into their culture way and find their families, it's so hard and We've had so many that were taken away and you know, no one knew who they were, where they went and how they tracked their families back through a family tree and when they do come back into our communities. And I think for our, um, for our tribe being so strong, we would always encourage and try to um, build up that relationship mm -hmm with those who were taken away and to find out where they were taken away from and, and who are the connections they have and that has been a great deal in our community. And I can tell you one incident when my brother was taken away when he was newborn. And all my years I've grown up, when I turned 19, he came back home and I said, who is he? Where he come from? How come no one told me about you? You know, how come you, you're my brother? And then everyone accepted him straight away because they knew who he was and where he was born and why he was taken away. And I said, oh. And th that was the exciting thing for me, for this brother of mine to come back himself, to find his way back. He found his way back home. And do you think there are similarities between this, this issue of so many young people being in detention and the stolen generation that happened to your brother. Are there similarities here between these two issues for your community? Some are, and some are different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not all tied up into that one section. There could be other family matters that's happening. And, yeah, like, what's the name said? Um, because, yeah, <laughs> m many of our families get into strife because they don't have a license and they don't understand about the what the police tell them because in those early days our families probably left school at an early age and didn't have a proper education. So there is a big gap within that area and it's so hard for our families. But today, as I've said, I see a lot of changes coming into our community through Ministry of Justice and through our own local people getting jobs and helping others to get their license and these are Aboriginal people putting up, putting, putting themselves and saying, no, I want to help my family. I want to get a job as a driver's instruction. And so we have that, and I've seen a lot of changes now. And for them to come out of prison knowing that they've got a bad record, and we would encourage our families, bad record is nothing. It's you being a community member. What can you do to change yourself and to help your family and to help this community rise above the issues that are happening? And... I guess we are on that road of looking to our future and making it better for our people and our community as well. There was a terrible event that happened in August this year for people who might not have read about it. A 22-year-old woman from South Headland was arrested and imprisoned there for the non-payment of around $1,000 in fines, just $1,000 in fines. And this young Indigenous woman, Miss Du, she complained of feeling ill and she was taken by the police to a health clinic twice and she was deemed fit enough to return to her cell. And just two days after Miss Du was arrested for not paying her fines, she passed away in her cell on the 4th of August this year. 
and witnesses who were in there with Miss Du say that they heard her repeatedly calling for help, vomiting, crying. When that happened so recently, Allery, what, what goes through your mind? I mean, you still remember what happened to your nephew all those years ago that, that triggered that Royal Commission. How does it make you feel when that's still happening now in 2014? I guess it's make me angry to hear that sad story. And, you know, you look at this day when someone gets picked up, they don't get taken into jail. They go into custody and then you have your parents or someone that knows you to be there and to look at why has this person been picked up and what is the reason. And you look at the today's issue in our community where someone is taken to the lockup and then taken home, then you come back to court the next morning. That should have happened to this young girl. She would have been still alive today if, if that was the case. And for this family to go through what we went through a long time ago, it, it is really, really sad and it's heartbreaking and there's so many questions in our minds and in our hearts. And I reckon for the hip bone sticking out, is telling a little bit of story of what happened to our, my nephew on that day, how it really disrupted the community. And I guess the people in Hedland would be feeling the same pressure now, what we went through. And that took us 30 years for this mother to have peace within her. And yet she still, still think about it. The name pops up, she'll start weeping and crying and thinking about it. And I guess this same family is going through the same issue. And for young people that get locked up like that, you know, where is their medical records? Why can't the hospital would have had that medical issue about this young girl, you know? And why couldn't the police just board in a mother or a father and sat with them and look at their condition, you know? Don't just completely lock her off. It's not on. Scott, can you tell us about the recommendations of that Royal Commission? thinking about what happened to Miss Doo just so recently, have they been, been implemented all these years later? Um, well, uh, there were 339 recommendations. None of us are really sure how many are uh, in place because it, when you look at the... But it's less, you know, at least 300 aren't, put it that way, because when you look at the way the mishmash of, of the justice system and, and what each state does and each state does differently, there, there is, there is um, you know, it's dysfunctional and, and there is a responsibility amongst those people that we as taxpayers pay to represent us and to be senior advisors to those who represent us. And they are failing us as a community and they are failing young people. And if you, if you look at that young woman's story, um, historically, the family name is Roe, and um, Septimus Roe was an explorer who, who Robin is named after. So she, she's in this, this line of this um, family that was very influential in the Pilbara, in both good ways and bad ways. And it happened to her in... Um, in a lockup. What I find difficult about that story is that she, she was covered in dry vomit. Mm. Now, that, how could that happen? You know, why did that happen? What, what was the dysfunction in the training for the young constables, you know, who were surrounding her? Um, even if she was well, even if she would drunk too much, what, what does that mean to be lying in your own vomit in Australia? If you look at the story of Mr Ward, who passed away um, I some years ago now, as a result of being driven for hundreds of kilometres in the back of a police van without air conditioning. He was cooked by us. That's His status was, you know, it's very hard to find a white equivalent, but it was we cooked... Sir Don Bradman, you know, or we cooked Malcolm Fraser, or we, however you want to see it, he was a very important man. The, 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 I'm not harking back to story exactly, but these things happen because 
of the way in which we conceptualise the country that we are and, and, you know, who we could become as a country. And I don't know if there are artists here tonight, but your work is... You can feel powerless, but your work and where you place it and the policy ramifications that can sit alongside it and seeing applied storytelling, seeing the service to the community of that, you know, it's an incredibly powerful profession to be in and especially if you can sit alongside other parts of the community together and, you know, and work. To me, um, you know, we have to accept the heartbreaking nature of it and but it's also very easy to get sucked into the grief of that instead of going, what is the legacy to the grief? Now, I'm not sure if Maisie is here tonight. Um, hi, hello. You know, family member, somebody who's entrusted your story to, to this organisation and the sponsors of it. You know, and we thank you for that because of the legacy of that passing of that young man. And in a sense, you're passing that baton to these two young men as they go around the country telling their story. You know, it's vital, optimistic work. And, I mean, I would love to, to get that story of Mr Ward out, not as an Indigenous story, but as a story that I'm responsible for and my sons are responsible for and help to move forward. As much as Mr Dew's case indicates that some things haven't changed at all, you and your company have been involved in a really interesting and incredible decision by a magistrate that, that illustrated that things are slowly changing in some areas. Can you tell us about what this particular magistrate in West Australia, what he decided to do with someone's case? Yeah, sure. Um, again, it's a, a very talented um, young person that you know him for a few hours and you see his potential. And... Um, and this magistrate, instead of sentencing him to, to juvenile justice, sentenced him to big art. It was smart justice. And he's, he's now providing a lot of leadership um, in the public domain, in the storytelling domain, <clears throat> you know, with his own, um, his own story. And, and to me, that's one option, one, one of many options. What would it mean to work more closely with Briety? Um, what, what, what are intercultural smart justice projects that have new infrastructure? Um, what, does it, what does it mean if you steal a car, if you're washing, you know, Ferraris for a local car dealer? Do you know what I mean? What, what are the, the ways of, of thinking through those things? And, you know, the most law-abiding section of our community is young people. But we're taught, we're taught the opposite. Statistically, there are no white-collar criminals... There are no tax avoiders. They are slightly scary looking because of our own shadow of our own mortality, which makes us fear them. But um, again, it's a way of thinking about the story of, of young people. And, you know, it's not about the government. It, it's about, I don't know, what do you do? What's, what's your business? How can, go, you know, go to Deer Park, go and work with, offer your services, build things into your own situation. It's not up to the other people. You know, it's us here in this room. We want to have time for questions tonight, so I just want to ask one last thing to you, Barbara. With your research and your experience dealing with government on all different levels, how do you think... What do you think is the best approach in trying to get this issue on the agenda in the next election? Because at the moment it does feel it's something that all sides of politics aren't paying enough attention to. What's your advice? I think it's, it is very difficult with government. Like, government is so risk-adverse that they don't want to sort of step out of the ordinary or, or try anything new. But I think it's such a wicked problem. And by wicked, I mean it's a problem that can't be solved by one single thing, whether it's government. It's actually going to take everybody. And I think that we, we need to look at uh, different ways that we can actually tackle it and... I would really like to see an emphasis on education, early intervention, because the research is out there that, you know, invest $1 in a child, it'll save you $7 up here. But in terms of getting it government, I mean, I think Scott had a great idea about just writing to the politicians, demand action and try and, and uh, ensure that, you know, it's not just one government department, but it has to be health, 
education, justice, housing, the whole, the whole lot that we need to have a combined action where we actually wrap around the care for young offenders and, and engage the community in meaningful ways because it can't be government, it can't be community, it can't be business, it has to be everybody and everybody has got a role to play and I think you know, the, the idea of engaging with art and those storytelling because one of the, the tragedies I think, and I'll just speak briefly about in Gundigai, um, which is a, a town where there's a dog on a tucker box and probably a lot of people heard about the dog on the tucker box, but who's heard about Yari? Yari is actually a Wiradjuri man who saved 49 people in one night where there was floods and he, um, he was in a little canoe, picked, kids, picked people up out of trees and saved a quarter of the population. Where do we hear about those stories? We need more of those stories. We need heroes. We need Aboriginal heroes that the young people can look up to and aspire to. So I think it's a whole, of, whole of approach, not just one single thing. I'd like to open it up now for questions from the audience. So please just put your hand up and there's some microphones making their way around. Right. Please stand up. Okay. Great. My name's Marie and I'll be the bunny to kick it off. I've just got two comments to make first and then I've got a question coming up. The first is related to Miss Dew. I don't know if everybody's aware there's an Australia-wide um, day of support and in Melbourne, it's on the 23rd of October. It's either 12 noon or 12.30 at the old GPO. So if you want to turn up for that. Another point I want to make is just going to... I can't say it. Mul He was um, uh, Cameron Dumagee. He was the one who was murdered up in Townsville. And um, because of the protesting, for the first time ever... A policeman was brought before the courts that was senior Sergeant Hurley got to go to court naturally with the white uh, jury and system. He got let off, of course. <laughs> but to get him there was a start. So I think our first problem is the police, isn't it? That they really have to be held accountable for the murders that they commit. So I'm going to um, think... Oh, just one other point too first. Do you have is, a question? Yes, I do. No, I just thought, you know, getting Aboriginal people into Parliament's another great idea, but here comes my question. I was just thinking, Auntie, whether... Um, I, think, I see Aboriginal people, and I'm just wondering how their self-esteem is. I see beautiful people. I wish they'd look in the mirror and just see how wonderful they are. So I'm thinking, what about if... Um, like corroborees and initiation ceremonies and all those sort of things that white mankind sort of made you do away with, what if they were sort of start brought back into the communities? No, no, I don't mean the cutting when I say initiation. I just say, look, you're a boy and go in the bush and when you come out, you're a man now, you've got responsibilities. What do you think, Ellery? Well, our cultural law is still strong and those who go through the law... They probably go at an early age, but they know that they are men in their own culture, but in the white man's society, you're still underage if you're 15, 16, 17, because once you're diagnosed when you're 18, you're a man. So our culture is still very strong, and many of our young people participate in it. And, and we keep it strong because our culture... We have a culture where it gives us identity of who we are and how we respect each other, not only our own community but the respect that we have in other communities that are nearby us from different tribes and that is still going strong and, yeah. Allery, sorry, do you mind if I just mention that thing from the end of the show because I think that's yep. both a good question and a terrible thing to say. At the end of the show, some story that came to us when, when John died at, at 16, he'd be 47 today, he would be negotiating with Twiggy Forrest and a leader in his community. When he died, there were around 30 people turning up for, for traditional law business on the outskirts of Robin. Last year, there were thousands. That's a story that's not told, and it's what Allery's saying about strength of law and culture, and we have to be so careful, even as a questioner, 
about per perpetuating uh, what is actually a destructive myth that's used to, as part of the genocide. And can I just also add to, I'm aware in New South Wales that there's a, a group of, um, or a number of groups of young men and older men going bush. Mm. And it's and that's increasing in numbers that they're doing that and teaching them respect and support and and the ways of doing things. And, and certainly, as an employer, you know people are at least to go and uh, the the more senior guys to help out with the law and the the younger guys to participate. So I think it I think it is something that's really strong and particularly has got very very strong around Roeburn again in the last you know five to ten years particularly. It's a fantastic thing. That is the, that's the story of this country. That's, that is an Indigenous story, not the one of misery and, and failure. And, you know, we've got to be so careful about how we frame those things. It's such a privilege to... to I didn't know that, you know. It's such a privilege to learn that story. It's one of the first things that we were told when we were listening. Yeah, and you have troubled people in every town and city. Until you see a welcoming party like we've seen here, it just amazes me to see how many tribes are living here in Melbourne and I was really excited to see Aboriginal people, you know. And sometimes you can mistake them for a white lady, but, you know, they're <laughs> Aboriginal people and I really enjoyed what they've done and how they welcomed us into our country. It shows me that they are strong Aboriginal people and their tribes are picking up and building and making their tribes strong and that's what I'd like to see in every every place that we travel to and you know it's an exciting thing when you get together as Aboriginal people and today we come as white or it doesn't matter what colour skin you are or where you come from you know we all have a heart and we all have a soul and today we come to hear each other and to see where we can go from here. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, um, hi, you talk about spreading the stories and I just wondered whether what work you do in the education system and taking the stories to our young people. Um, was that addressed to any of us? Okay. What's your name, sorry? Alex. Thanks, Alex. Um, well, to give you an, an idea, the invitation in to, um, to work with... Um, the community of Robin to tell the new Robin story, the one of cultural strength, involves also looking at things of grief and and hip bone sticking out is is um, the story of of John Pat uh, in the last two hours of his life uh, as he observed history since 1602 to look at um, how globalisation since the the Dutch East India Company has swept slowly closer and closer to the Pilbara and then crashed on the shore and the wave is still breaking and uh, and you know that's the story now that the consequences of all that and it's it's Nelson who plays John Pat do you mind standing up Nelson again <laughs> this is Nelson incredibly talented young man <laughs> and there are still and tickets left to sorry? see Nelson there's still tickets left there's yeah. information at the back Great. to see Nelson tomorrow night and that story um, was broken we were up in the Pilbara rehearsing and we did a, a version in the in Robin prison district prison um, and in front of a room that looked, looks very like you, um, only with a different amount of pigment in the skin and uh, with d different experiences. And th these are just as stories and stories that you would get angry to listen to. That was a fantastic thing. We, a few nights later, we did uh, a bigger show again in the outdoors for 800 community members um, under the stars in situ. And the same stories c can be broken apart into theatre and education shows. And you can tell theatre stories, you know, in that way, touring. We, we're discussing with, um, with Niffle, who uh, Nalaman Injibandi Foundation up there that, that um, work with Brighty, that run a brand new cultural centre up there to, to take the stories out of there. And we're going to be the company in res residence there for the next three years. Um, how, however, that's just one form of storytelling. There's people here, people who've worked on Neomad, which is a, an iPad-based interactive um, uh, comic that, that tells a future story, a futuristic indigenous story. Um, and it's made by these guys and a whole lot of their friends. Um, there's the Muru concert that, that, that is also available and, and is performing in schools. And yes, the, the beauty of, um, of ideas going to the, to the hotbed of, 
I mean, most of schooling is about diminishing your capacity to have ideas so that you can become a drone and work in certain kinds of ways. So within that, within that is a great opportunity to, to be super sparky. That's not necessarily a negative thing because if you're brilliant, you go in, then those ideas will, will lodge there. And we're, you know, we're talking about doing a theatre and education uh, piece. Peter's heart is in us getting Muru out there for these 20 shows so it is working on all those levels, and yes, school is a very important part of that. Scholastic, I think, is interested in Neomad and some of the other work to get that into the curriculum. And we've got we did a thing called Namajira, which was about Namajira. That's on the HSC reading list. Uh, years before that, there was Box the Pony, which is on the HSC reading list, which is something I worked on with Leah Purcell. Those things are lodging in that education system as as you know, big ideas, bright ideas. It's a pretty interesting tie-up, I think, into the community to get um, people with festival experience uh, working in, in and around Roeburn where there are you know, 2,000 people that come for law each year and it you know, provides quite a difficult uh, logistics problem to solve. So I think you know, doing 20 shows throughout uh, Western Australia will also give the community a better ability to deal with that law, that law issue each year that they have to and the logistics around it. Mm. We have time for one or two more questions. Get in the front row. Um, my name's Rachel. Um, this is a question for Scott. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier when you were talking about Mr Ward's story um, that it was a... Or it, it is a story that you see as um, your... Uh, as a story that you're responsible for, or that in, in part, that it's not an Aboriginal story alone, that it's a white story. I'm just wondering if you can shed some light on how we might get white Australians to start to see stories like Mr Ward's as uh, white stories. Yeah. Mm. Um, we met Mr Ward when we were researching, when Trevor Jamison and I were working on a, a big project called Napogee Napogee, and um, he was an important man then. His, his, uh, if you want to use those terms of um, indig an Indigenous story, his whole life w is an incredible story of which most of it is private and culturally private. And um, there's people like him who, and Allery, for instance, is in you know, is with us on tour to provide a kind of cultural and spiritual OHS for the company. And he was like that. And that's conceptually, when we're successful in 25 years, that will be a normal practice, thinking of OHS in those terms. And Mr. Ward's whole life is of strength is, a, is an Indigenous story. And what happened in the van and the, is a white story. And, and I feel very compassionate for the driver and I mean, imagine that could have been me, just a little bit neg negligent. It'll be okay. Uh, and and so, it's not about blame in that in that sense, but it is about acknowledging um, the as one country working together, Muruguthara, that the the future. You know, we've just swept onto the coast, and the future, as David Island has put it, is in the belly of the country, not the coastal rind. That's not to write off the, the, the coast, but that's where the big heart, that's where the, the heart of the country, that's where the big stuff is. That's where the, you know, people who know I don't because I'm insensitive, but that's where the powerful things happen. I mean, on one occasion on a project, I had to to, to get some senior women, pitch and jarrow women, to help me because I was in a kind of strange um you know, situation. So I can describe it as like a dark form of crushing out on somebody that you can't get out of. And and I had to go and see them. I was in a powerful part of the country. I think I don't know what I what went on exactly. I don't know anything about that stuff. But they, you know, sucked something out of my belly in a lounge room while watching Nickel, Nicholas Nickleby on television. <laughs> and I felt better. And there is something of the future of the country in that powerful centre, and it's, it's an identity thing for us all, it's a cultural thing. And, you know, that's incredibly generous, coming from parts of the country that we are responsible for the dispossession. So 
I would say, in answer to your question, that if you think, I don't know if you're a writer or if you work in those sorts of areas, but if you think of the dramaturgy of a play or a story is very similar to the dramaturgy of, of change being possible in communities and in countries. It's not, it's not a big leap, but we tend to be pretty stupid and pretty adversarial and pretty immature instead of entering into places of shared value you know, I don't know anything about construction, I don't, but we've had a few conversations now and it's a building relationship. I didn't know anything about Allery's world, but, you know, she doesn't like swearing. You know, I swear quite a lot <laughs> when I'm working in the rehearsal room and she goes like this, she goes, and that's it. <laughs> you know, shared, shared values, <laughs> you know, finding the place where, we can sh where you can work with Andrew Forrest, you know, and be a somebody who's an environmentalist or where you can work with Woodside and somebody who, who also loves the Burrup Peninsula. You know, it's a bigger conversation than we can answer now, but it's finding the common story and within that there's the acknowledgement of stories that are ours to, to, to tell. And there are fantastic white stories, you know, non-Indigenous stories and, and fantastic you know, non-Indigenous artists working in in and with Indigenous communities. And one of the litmus tests, I'm going to shut up, I promise. Mm -hmm. One of the litmus tests is when we don't, when we allow that transference between two senior people in a project, Allery and myself, without reading race. I think that's a great point to end it on tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>